Hi, everybody. Okay. Well, we're going and I'm right on time. Ooh, it's 101. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Garden Coach. Um, I'm Jennifer Brennan. I'm the horticulture information specialist here at Chalet, and I've been here for too many years to say out loud. Uh, a lot of you probably know, and I'm looking to see, okay, where is this? We've got 16 people signed in. Hello, everybody. And I'm gonna set up the, uh, the chat, the chat box. There we go. And, um, okay, here we go. All right. Okay. This is good. She says, and then the Q&A, let's open the questions and answers. I'm gonna put this over here. So we have no open questions there and no chat box questions here. Let me just put this down. I think we're going, let me, my, I'm trying to get the chat box. Usually what I do is I introduce everything and, uh, and then I go over the notes. You all got copies of the notes. And then also we're doing um, a list of the products that I'll talk about today. And then they, we also have a link uh, on our website that, so that you can, um, you can find them quickly and order online. So you don't have to come into the store. We'd love you to have to come in the store. But, um, but, oh, here we go. Here is the chat. Let's see where that's going. Oh, I see over here. The q and is gonna go on this side. Okay, now we're good, now I'm good. And then I have the chat. Uh, okay, uh, and I'll get I'll, I'll address the questions after I go over the notes. All right, so everyone can kind of stay um, stay along with this, and then we'll do the questions and answers afterwards. So I think this is working pretty well. Um, I, I love that everyone is really enjoying using our new. Um, it's called the Chalet Information Center, and um, and so or the Plant Information Center. So it P I C Plant Information Center, and and then you also are enjoying um, our customer call center and you can call the Shelly number that goes directly to the customer call center and then they direct your call to the proper person. And, um, and then we also have a wonderful way if you wanna do it with email and you, you use the, um, the address hello at chaletnursery.com and then your your questions get sent to the to the correct person as well so so let's go ahead and get started everybody and it looks like i still have um let me see oh we've got 25 people welcome 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 jennifer brennan here and um and and uh, check there was an extra email that went out after this email that you you use to link in to um the the zoom webinar and then the other one has the handout of the notes that i'm going to be going over about what we've been seeing and what you need to do in your garden in in this next week and then also a list of the plants that i'm or the plants the products i'm going to be talking about all right now the first topic number one number one number one is wow didn't mother nature do us a huge favor by lowering the temperatures i know i am like a whole new person i'm hoping all of you two are just as appreciative of the cooler temperatures that we're having oh my gosh it's just been heaven and you know what else is absolutely loving these cooler temperatures our turf grasses our lawns oh my goodness this came at just the right time I mean, it couldn't have come later or we would have had just serious, serious problems. We, we have some serious disease problems in the lawns right now because of that wet weekend in May. Uh, we had that eight inch um, weekend, the third weekend of May. That was the time when all of the fungal diseases that can attack the lawns were active. They, they started waking up the 15th of May. And then when we had that heavy eight inches of rain over that, 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 that weekend, it really benefited the fungus over the grasses. And so a lot of our grasses got inoculated. That means the fungus got into the tissues of the grass plants, either the roots, the blades, or the crown. We call that the bedour. And, and then 
because of the heat and the drought, we really have not had nearly enough rain. And even with this cool down, I was hoping that we'd get a half an inch of rain every other day, but Mother Nature hasn't done that for us. But we can at least add water. We can water our lawns, we can water all our plants, and that will really, really, really help them. So, so um, uh, honestly, I, I just, I cannot emphasize enough how beneficial this has been for our, our lawns. Um, these are cool season turf grasses that are not, the, the reason we use cool season turf grasses is they're the ones that can survive our cold, cold, cold temperatures in the winter. They're used to only experiencing six to 10 days over 85 or 90 in the summertime, because that's our usual number of, of, of hot, hot days. Oh, I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> I do this every time because <coughs> I've unbagged all the disease samples on the table. You would think I would not have this business because I have, I'm allergic to fungus. But anyway, the, um, the turf grasses, what happened is they get inoculated in May. And it's sort of like when we get a cold, you know, we get a cold and we just, we just keep going to work. We keep going to the store. We keep doing what we always have to do. We don't feel great, but we're not dying. And then if we get enough sleep, if we eat right and we don't have any stress, we get over it. If we don't get enough sleep, we don't eat right, and we get under stress, then it goes into something more serious like pneumonia. And that's what's happened to our turf grasses. They were inoculated with the fungal things, and it's like dollar spot. Dollar spot was really early in the season, and it kind of reared its head again in the last three weeks. And dollar spot, and I always make jokes about the turf guys with their creative naming of their diseases. Dollar spot is called dollar spot because they're brown patches in the, in, the, in the turf that are only the size of a silver dollar. Okay, then the next one is summer patch. Those are patches that are as, as, as large as six inches in diameter and they're brown and they're called summer patch because they occur in the summer. Then there's also brown patch and brown patch, the patches are brown <laughs> and they occur in the summer. Brown patch and summer patch occur about the same time. It's two different fung fungal organisms. One is Rhizoctonia, the other is Magnaporta, and, and, and then there's Pythium. And Pythium, it, it, we've also seen that. So because of the high humidity and the high heat, we were seeing all four or five of the major um, fungal diseases at the same time. So it really got bad the, the, the last week before we had this cool off and the brown patches showed up everywhere. People were coming in with samples left and right. I was getting, and I have been getting probably, probably four to five samples a day of turf grasses. And then we also have the complication about the creeping bent grass decided to turn brown because it was too dry. And, and, and they didn't mind the heat, but there wasn't enough water to keep it growing strong and happy. So, so we saw all that, we saw all that. So get, getting to, okay, now what do I do about it? So the best time of year and the number one time to fertilize, if you're only going to fertilize the lawn once a year, the Labor Day fertilization is the most important because the grass plants will use all of that nitrogen and they use it very efficiently and, and, and when the snows are really warm like this. So, so it's the Labor Day fertilization is usually between August 15th and September 15th. You have that four week window where that's the time, you know, the best time to put it down. So, so because our turf has been so stressed, um, it's okay and with this cool down, oh my gosh, perfect timing. Get your fall fertilizer down a little bit early. So like this weekend, and I know it's gonna get warmer, but the, the, because of the change in the night temperatures uh, uh, compared to the day temperatures and this nice reduction that we've had, water the lawn really well. Give it a good, good soaking. And then the next day, use your lawn fertilizer. My favorite to recommend is the, um, the Espoma brand 
lawn fertilizer. It, and we call it the red bag because it has a burgundy package and it's, it's earth friendly natural. It's made from organically based um, fertilizers. It is, it does have a little extra nitrogen in it. So we call it juiced. So you'll get a quicker green up by using it, but it's a slow release long term. So it's going to last a good solid eight weeks. And so you, know, you get that down and then water it in afterwards. Now, if you have more than 20, 25% weeds in your lawn, consider using a weed and feed. And that is the same product. It's a bonide and it just says weed and feed on the package. You can use it in the spring, late spring, which is like late, late May, early June. And also in fall, you can use it as a Labor Day. And so if you've got a lot of weeds, go ahead. Now, the most important thing for using that is you wanna make sure that there's no rain predicted for 24 hours because the, the herbicide, which is in the granules, the granules have an herbicide and a fertilizer in them. The herbicide has to sit on the surface of the leaves, the weed leaves for 24 hours. And so you want those weeds, you want the surface moist. So you can either do it early in the morning when the dew points are very high and you know you can spread it or water lightly before you before you do this you know put it in the spreader and put it on you want those granules to stay on the surface of the weeds for 24 hours then after that you can wash it off and that'll make all the fertilizer go down into the soil and then it will grow the grow the grass plants the weeds will will die in five to ten days now there are difficult common weeds that might need a second a second application, and that's what that's when you're going to use the the Bonide brand um, chickweed clover and oxalis spray, and it's labeled for over 200 weeds, and you can spray you can just walk around and spot spray. You know a lot of the weeds are just going to die out from the weed and feed, but you know that things like like creeping Charlie, um, chickweed, clover. And um, violets. Violets. Violets look like this. Violets look like this. They have these heart-shaped leaves. When you do pull them out, see all of these. They're called. They're called bulblets or corms. See those little round bulblets here. This is going to show up better right here. See those are the bulblets. So you have to get those all out. If you leave those in the ground, they come back next year. So they have a lot of stored energy. In them. So when you use the weed and feed, when you use the weed and feed, it's going to kill the leaves. It may kill some of the little small roots that are in, in the soil, but the bulblets or corms are still in the soil. They will tend to put leaves back up six to eight weeks later. That's when you come back and spray with the chickweed clover and oxalis. And then every time you see those leaves come up, spray again. And it, it will happen every six to eight weeks. Pretty soon, all the energy is going to be gone from those bulbless and you will have killed the, the plant. Now, if you leave the leaves up for longer than five days, they're going to be photosynthesizing, making energy and storing it in those bulbless and they'll just keep, they'll just come coming back and back and back. So I hate to give you that bad news, but we have the tools to get rid of them. Creeping Charlie is another one that's a little difficult um, because it has a slow metabolism and it's hard for the, the liquid fertilizers to penetrate through the waxy cuticle on the leaf. A neat trick that we learned and we call, his name was Doug. He was one of our reps for our, our, our products, our products, and he was a wholesaler's rep. And he, he would always say, you got to do the Doug dance. And that means just stand on top of the creeping Charlie and, and, and squish your feet back and forth, twist your feet back and forth. And, and what that does is that cracks the cuticle and then put either the weed and feed down or spot spray. And then the herbicide can get into the plant and it kills it faster. Now, when you fertilize too, you're rubbing the metabolism up and Creeping Charlie has a very low metabolism. When you give it fertilizer, it revs the metabolism up. It will pull in the herbicide faster and it'll kill it faster. So all of these neat insider's tricks on how to make your lawn, rejuvenate your lawn. And if you do these things, fertilize, kill the weeds, 
and um, you know, and and do this, your lawn will look completely new by the end of September. It'll be thickened up, no weeds, no room for weed seeds to even get started next spring. So now is the time to fix that lawn. I'm getting calls. I had three people talk to me this morning in the plant in, in you know information center about how they always had the best lawn in the neighborhood, and this is the first year they've had awful looking lawns everybody has an awful lawn right now it just was so tough with this heat and 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 the, and the lack of rain okay now there's one other thing if you do have uh, creeping bent grass and peeping creeping bent grass is a weed that is and, and i have a good example in these baggies right here this is this is what creeping bent grass looks like i think you'll be able to see yeah oh yeah it's showing really well that's creeping bent grass it's stringy it has little roots that try to go down and root in through the um the the the, the thatch of the bluegrass it grows on top of the bluegrass and you get sheets of it and and so you know so so if you have that there is a great product that will get rid of it. It's called mesotrione. It was, it was invented, I think it's been 20 years. The liquid form was invented. And, and then mostly, and mostly only uh, turf, and, turf and, you know, soil and, um, and turf or soil and lawn um, applicators had it to use and because it was a restricted use. And, and by the time we realized that you know, we could get it, you know, there were other competitors like Amazon that sold it. And so we decided not to carry the liquid. But five years ago, and I've talked about this before, but I actually have an empty bag so I can show you what it looks like, you know, without having to lift 25 pounds. It, this is, this is, it's a Scott's brand, Scott's brand. And it's called, it's called step one for seeding. And the active ingredient is right here. It's mesotrione. See right there. Uh, mesotrione is, it's going to say it right there. Oh, wait, I got to see. I have to look at it. Oh, no, it's up there. Mesotrione. See how to, mesotrione. Now, the fertilizer is excellent in this. Okay, so it is, it's a 21 4 So that means it's got a lot of phosphorus in it. Now, legally, lawn foods can't have phosphorus because of the phosphorus, you know, bothering our waterways. But if you're going to seed, it's legal to use this. And so, so it's always a good thing to put a disease resistant grass seed down this time of year. And what I want you to do is kill the weeds, then fertilize. And, and then, and then if, if you do have creeping vent, use this Scott step one for seeding as your fertilizer and it, it'll work as a pre-emergent. And then what's cool about the mesotrione, it sits on the creeping vent grass and burns out the chlorophyll. So it all turns white and it gets rid of it. It's so wonderful. So I, I use this on my lawn. I do it this time of year and then I do it again every spring. I do that as my spring uh, pre-emergent and crabgrass preventer because it'll prevent crabgrass seeds from germinating, um, but it will not keep grass seed. So it, you, know, you can put a good disease resistant chalet's grass seed is really wonderful. It's made, it's mixed and blended by a company that does grass seed for golf courses in southeastern Wisconsin and northeastern Illinois. And they do their mixes. That's when you do bluegrasses and perennial ryegrasses and creeping fescues. They're the mixes and the names of the name varieties of those grasses are changed every year based on the most disease resistant varieties. And it's based on the previous two years of diseases that we've been seeing in our environment, which is really neat research. So, so if you've not had good luck with other brands of grass seed, try the chalet. And we have the different types. We have a combo that's sun and shade. So you don't have to worry about which is it is, which it is. Just get that and it will, it will work no matter what. There's also sun. If you know you have full sun and that sun longer than five hours a day, there's a shade combination. And then there's an extreme dense shade, perfect for under trees, you know, where you have competition from the tree roots and the shade from the canopy. So, so we've got wonderful, wonderful grass seeds. So you, you overseed an existing lawn in the thin areas. And when you're doing that, all you need, one pound will cover 500 square feet when you're overseeding. If you're, if, you're, if you're fixing bare spots, one pound is only good for 300 square feet. 
but that's how you calculate how much you'll need to use. Okay. I'm going to sneeze again. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay. Now let's move on from turf. All right. Now, oh, I'm going to repeat water, water, water. We're not getting the rainfall. We should, the last time we had a rain, it was, it was pretty good. It was six tenths of an inch. And that was last week at my house. So kind of measure so you know what's at your house. The rest of them just little thunder boomers and two tenths of an inch. So I'm still encouraging watering the lawns, watering all your plants, you know, when, and I would do it three times a week to make sure we're catching up on the, the, the lack of rainfall. I had a great sample. Oh my gosh, I don't think I brought it. I had a great sample showing um, the, what happens to plants that aren't getting enough water. Oh, I didn't bring it. Hold on, hold on. Wait a minute. Nope, I didn't bring it. Ooh, it was a crazy morning, crazy morning. Before we move on, I want to show you something about the problems with high temperatures and using weed killers. So this sample came in yesterday, and this is a, this is a, a hydrangea. This is, this is one of the, the paniculata hydrangeas, and um, the, a, liquid, a liquid weed killer was sprayed around on the plant. And this is what happened to all the new growth. See, these are what the leaves are supposed to look like. See, there's nice full leaves. And this is what happens. Um, weed killers are, herbis they're, they're, they're herbicides are um, hormones, they're plant hormones. That's why you can spray a lawn with a, a broadleaf weed killer and it doesn't kill the lawn. It only kills the weeds that are broadleaf weeds. Well, all of our landscape plants are broadleaf plants. And so these weed killers, especially the 2,4-D, stay in the soil. They stay in the soil for 30 days. And if the temperature goes over 85, those chemicals volatilize and those vapors drift into the landscape plants. And this is what happens. And you can see it, this, these, these feel almost like plastic because instead of just making one cell dividing in two, one cell divides into 100. And so you get all of this kind of witch's brooming look and then see the, see the twisting on this one, see how those are all twisted and gnarled? That's what happens. And, and then, so you can see this one, this was the closest side to the lawn, and then this is a little bit further, but you can still see that twisting, and then, you know, and then, and then, and the, and the gnarling of all the, all the foliage. This is not gonna kill the plant. You can prune this off like she did, and then the rest of the plant will grow back just fine. But be aware of that, be aware of that. And now as the days get shorter, our landscape plants aren't gonna be, you know, um, metabolizing as quickly. And so if you wanna make sure you're not gonna damage any of your landscape plants, wait until, um, you know, the August 15th, or even as much as wait till Labor Day if you want to do the you know the weed killers then they'll still be effective, and then the days are going to be shorter. The plants, the landscape plants, are going to have the message: it's time to stop growing at the top. All of our landscape plants have been so confused because of the extreme heat, and so um, with, they started actively growing with these cold temperatures. And you'll notice your vegetable gardens are just going to go back into heavier production. The tomatoes are going to, you know, you're going to get more tomatoes, more cucumbers, more flowers to get more of these things with this drop in temperature. They're all, they're saying, oh my God, we can actually grow again. Okay. Now let's keep, let's keep moving on. I wanted to show that damage. Okay. Um, now, um, keep planting, keep planting, especially now that it's cooled off a bit. Oh my gosh, keep adding plants to your garden. Um, you know, there's a lot of bare spots in my own garden because the plants just stopped flowering when it was so hot. They just said, you know what, I can't look pretty. I just have to let water flow through me. So there's a lot of bare spots. So I'm gonna be looking at some of the, the great, great perennials that we still have out there. We're getting beautiful perennials down from the farm. And so be, come and be sure and come and take a look at them in, you know, in, our, in our yards. Beautiful, beautiful plants. And we have them right in the center, um, the center area. Um, so when you walk in, you see exactly what's, you know, what's available. It's, re it's really nice. It's really fun. Okay, so, um, all right, um, here we go. Um, now, things to watch out for in the garden. I've shown you some of them, but, um, you know, I talked about the creeping bent grass. 
and and a lot of times you'll just see whole brown areas across the top of the lawn. I don't want you to get a rake and really rake hard, but you can take just one of those small tined, um, you know, leaf rakes and actually just gently pull that 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 um, that creeping bent grass off the surface. Pull that up and and tear off as much of it as you can. And then, you know, and then when you use the Scott step one for seeding, that's going to land on, the, there's still some green leaves out there, the green blades, and that, that, that mesotrion will land on it and just get, and get it out of the, get it out of there. Um, okay, now, um, oh, we're just seeing so many insects and so much fungal, so much fungal, you know, so many fungal problems right now. So I've got some really neat, neat, you know, some neat, neat things to show you. Um, this is, this is, this is really interesting. And if you have euonymus, you probably know what this is. Yeah, euonymus scale, that's an insect. Those are all little, the, the, the white ones are females, the brown ones, and the brown ones are on the back. Isn't that funny? There's more brown ones on the back than on the front. And, but there are a lot of females on that. So the brown ones, the brown ones, see the brown ones? Those are the males. And so, um, so the females all have eggs under them. So the, the insecticide that we recommend using will kill the females, but nothing will kill the eggs. It will only restricted use. Um, this is another one you can see. See, oh, this really shows the difference between the brown and the, and the white. There are the males and the females. And then this is what it looks like on the surface. You have that yellow flecking. You don't see as many insects on the top. But it can really, it can really compromise um, an, you know, a euonymus. So you use a systemic insecticide. We, either, we have two brands. We have the Bonide, we have the Bioadvanced. And if it's, if it, usually these are ground covers or vines uh, you know, going up a wall. And so you measure the height of the vine or the diameter of you know the 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 depth of the the planting bed if it's a ground cover based on five foot sections and it's the depth in or the height of the vine up is the number of ounces of the chemical that you use and you add that to a gallon of water and then pour that gallon all over that five foot section of ground cover or the five foot section of you know where the stems of the euonymus are going into the ground it's absorbed by the plant, takes five days to four weeks to go all the way up to the tips. And as those insects are sucking the juices of the plant, they get the, the chemical and it kills them. And then they will, they will drop off over winter. Don't worry about scraping them off. You're too busy to have to do something like that. Um, but be aware that it doesn't kill the eggs and the eggs hatch every June and every September, the beginning of September. So you might see more of those white flecks and those brown flecks on, on new leaves and realize, oh, they're spreading. And you think, oh, it didn't work. Well, it is working because those insects are gonna start sucking the juices of the plant and it will kill them too. And then after a winter, the winter storms and the freezing and thawing causes it all to drop off. So, so that's one of the best things you can do. You wanna do that, you know, make sure you've treated your euonymus Magnolia for magnolia scale, um, and then you know, and then uh, viburnums, definitely viburnums. We're seeing the adults, and I showed you samples the last two weeks. We're still seeing samples. I'm not seeing as many of the adults, so they've done their work, and then they've died. You know, they 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 fed again, they mated, they laid eggs, and so you can see the eggs laid on the little twigs. I showed you that last week. So make sure you've treated your, you know, your viburnums. Okay, so um, now the, the fungal problems, the, the fungal problems, oh, I gotta talk about this one too. Um, this is, these are boxwood, okay? And see, those leaves are damaged because of the boxwood leaf miner that was in eating the mesophyll in between the two epidermal layers. And so this is proof that that, you know, that you have to make sure you've treated this with the systemic insecticide also. So that, that's good. Here's another one that you can see the new leaves. And I showed you this last week, but you can see, oh, this is interesting. These are the new leaves. This plant was actually treated with the insecticide. So look, the new leaves are nice and clean. No little flex, nothing. And you can tell that the, the person had the problem before. And you can see like the exit hole right there. 
from when it was in last year. And so they traded, and so all this new growth is fine. So and as the new growth keeps growing, it, it, you know, it fills out on the outer canopy and you, you don't notice, you don't notice that there was damage, you know, on it before. Okay, uh, the other things, even though we've warned people and warned people, this is black spot on roses and it's showing up with all the heat and the, and the lack of rainfall. So, you know, so if you didn't do your last treatment of your roses with the, uh, the bio advanced all in one, you can still squeeze one more application in this first week of, of August. And that has the fertilizer, it has the systemic insecticide and the systemic fungicide. That's also, that's the bio-advanced all-in-one rose and flower. You can also use that on the boxwoods, on the boxwood, because that would take care of the volutella stem blight and, and, then, and then the boxwood leaf liner the psyllids, that the other insects, and then it has that fertilizer. And now is a good time. Make sure you fertilize everything. Get one more application of fertilizer in. It's really going to help those plants, especially plant plants that are going to be making flower buds for next spring. So they're using those nutrients to finish making those flower buds. They didn't start making flower buds until July 15, and they weren't even doing it then because it was so hot. So once we've had this cool down, now the plants are making the flower buds for next season. So give them those building blocks, give them the nutrients, which is the fertilizer. Those are the building blocks they use to put their parts together. So, you know, so get, you know, get that down. Now, um, more fungal problems that we're seeing, powdery mildew on everything in the vegetable garden, cucumber, squash, even tomatoes. So spray with a sulfur-based um, product that will that it's an earth friendly natural control of of any of the mildews especially the powdery mildews or copper base that also works very 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 well um okay and then if they're insects um you know you want to use a pyrethrin based um and and if that's derived organically de derived from organically grown daisy plants and you spray it on at dusk kills the bad guys, doesn't hurt any of the good guys like the butterflies or the bees. And then the next morning when the sun shines on organically derived pyrethrin, it's broken down. So there's no residue. So you can spray one day and harvest the next. I love these wonderful earth only natural products that we have out there. You'll see them from Bonide and you'll also see them from Espoma and, and then Fungal Nil. We, we brought in another, not Fungal Nil, we brought in another line called um, Fertilome. Fertilome is another, another another really good earth-friendly natural product line that we're, we're gonna be carrying here at the store. So, okay, now, um, uh, the good news is the Japanese beetles are diminishing. We're seeing less and less and less because, you know, they're out for about six weeks. They, you know, they emerge from the ground, they mate, and then they feed, and then they lay eggs. Now, they're diminishing, that's good. So we're not going to see more damage on things like anything in the rose family, lindens, service berries, but, and grapes. They really did a job on a lot of those things. But beware, beware, beware that the, the, the Japanese beetle grubs will be hatching soon in the lawns. And with as many Japanese beetles as we saw, there could be a potential for a lot of, of grubs and grub damage. And either from the grubs themselves, if they're more than 12 per square foot, they'll eat all the roots off the grass and cause that to you know, brown out. And that's different from the circular patterns of the fungal diseases. You'll see whole brown sections. And then you also get the problem with um, skunks and raccoons that, um, that will be coming in digging up and they'll dig up your whole lawn looking for the one you might have each square foot. So be prepared to use a repellent like repels all and or grub X, get grub X down. Grub X, you still have time to use grub X. And then there's another one called grub beater. And the grub beater, you don't need to use until you're sure you have the grubs. And then by the time you see that you have grubs in your lawn, it's too late to use the grub X because it, it grub X takes about, you know, two weeks to activate. So now, yes, grub X. So then you would have to use grub beater and it kills the insects in, in 24 hours and it lasts in the cell for three to five days. So, you know, so, so, but right now you want grub X. 
Grub X, and that's by that's also by Scotts. That's a Scotts product, and we have that here. We have that here. Okay, so now, all right, all right, all right. Um, okay, okay, okay. Oh, I have a whole bunch of notes. What time is it? Okay, it's one thirty-five. I got. I gotta get. I gotta get moving here. Okay, so now, all right, we're still seeing rust on everything. Rust on on crab apples. Rust on apples, rust on hawthorns, rust on um, on, on you know, you know quince, and because it was so warm so early, and it was warm while it was still wet, it was perfect conditions for rust. So there's not anything you can do right now for the plant that has it. Just keep them well watered, give them fertilizer so they can get prepared for going forward. But you know, if you had rust this year there's a chance you'll have it again next year. So be prepared in April to spray with a systemic fungicide like Immunox, and you'll do that next April. Mark your calendar now to, you know, to, to prevent rust and prevent any of the apple scab damages. Um, spray with, uh, as a preventative in April, and it's, it lasts every two weeks. So then you wanna go, um, you wanna spray April 15th, then May 1st, in May 15th and then May 30th, May 30th. And we usually say three times, if we still continue staying rainy and wet, um, then you do it up to five times. And that protects, it's so wonderful. It really protects things well. Okay, so um, uh, one of my, my favorite ones is that BioAdvance three-in-one spray. And, and that we have that in a ready to use spray, spot, spray bottle and also a hose in sprayer. Unfortunately, we're waiting on back stock, right? We're waiting on a, a, back, a, a, you know, a back stock re, a order and it should probably be in next week. But I love that because it's an insecticide, it's a fungicide and a miticide all in one. And you can spray it on and it's absorbed in the leaves immediately. Okay, so lots and lots of slugs still out there. The heat and humidity was just the perfect condition. So keep treating for your slugs every two weeks using sluggo, you know, using sluggo. That's the granular that's made from flour, sugar, and water, and then iron phosphate. The slugs can't resist. They eat those pellets and then, and then the iron phosphate kills their appetite. They stop feeding, so the damage stops immediately but reapply every two weeks and keep doing that because you want to get rid of, it, it, get rid of as many slugs as you can now because otherwise when the temperatures really start to drop, they crawl into the leaf litter down at the ground level and then they overwinter and they're there to come back next spring. So get rid of them as, you know, with as many as you can with sluggo. Sluggo will do that. Okay, now the animals are still going after our tomatoes, our peppers, all of our crops, all of our crops. So you want to use, you know, good, good repellent. My favorite to put around a whole garden is a new product that, that we just um, brought in this season. It was new from the company and it's called Rat Magic. It's a horrible name because it does repel rats, but it also repels chipmunks and squirrels. And you can do a barrier treatment around your whole vegetable garden. And when they approach it, you want to do a two foot wide um, area around the border of your, of your vegetable garden. And when they are walking across the grass to get to your garden, then they smell that. And if it gets into their system, it's made from cedarwood oil, also, also castor oil. If they get it on their paws and clean their hands, same thing happens to them is what happens to us when grandma used to give it to us. And then we also have um, cinnamon in it and um, clove, clove, and those really irritate their nasal passages. So they'll just go another, they'll go to another area. Okay, now, um, again, that's gonna take care of um, chipmunks and squirrels with tomatoes and cucumbers and all the vegetables, and peppers, they eat the peppers too. If you're still having a problem with rabbits, you know, use either plant skeed, repels all, or the liquid fence designed for rabbits. And you spray it on the leaves of the plant that they're actually eating, and that will repel them. And, it, and, and a lot of these will stay on for two months after they've been sprayed. So what you need to do is spray the new foliage. Things are slowing down right now, so you're not seeing as much new foliage. So those applications are really gonna be effective and they're really gonna work. Okay, so now, now it's 140. So, ooh, I did pretty good, didn't I? All right, now I'm gonna just go over the what to do, just in order. So number one, apply your lawn fertilizer. 
and get your weed killer down and, uh, and, and, and then do one more application of fertilizer on all your landscape plants, you know, your trees and shrubs. We love holly tone because it's, it's organically based. It has that 5% sulfur, so it lowers our high pH, but get holly tone on everything. For trees, you wanna use one pound, which is three cups, you know, for every inch of trunk diameter. And then you look at the canopy of the tree. So if my canopy came in this far, draw a line circle to the ground, draw a circle, and you're gonna spread the holly tone all over that circle, even if it's on top of turf or, or lawn. And then, and then also you wanna do any of all of your shrubs, rhododendrons and azaleas, do you know, any of your fruiting trees and shrubs, get a fertilizer down now, do it as soon as you can, do it before this weekend is up. And then it's not too late. If you do it after the 15th of August, it's too late. It's too late because then it's like giving and never do any fertilizer after the 15th of August or in the whole month of September. It's like giving somebody a shot of Turkish espresso like a half hour before they're supposed to go to bed. They'll never go to sleep. And so when you do that, plants ignore the signals from mother nature, you know, the short days and the cooler nights, and they don't go, they don't go, they don't shut down like they should. And then they have, they keep growing. You have this active new growth that is very susceptible to the first hard freeze and our average first frost. I can't believe I'm talking about this. Our average first frost is um, October 15th. And it, like, this is ridiculous. I mean, we just got over blazing heat and I'm already warning you about the first frost. Oh, shame on me. I'm so sorry. Okay, so now, um, okay, now here we go. All right, drench, drench your roses, crab apples, grapes, and then spray the vegetable gardens and apply animal repellents. So we went over, these are all the notes, and then go to, um, you know, go to our webpage and you'll see, you know, you know, buy online and there'll be a whole category of the, 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 uh, the, the garden coach. And it lists all the, all, the, all the products that I've talked about. So it makes them easy to find, really easy to find. Uh, okay, now let me see, let's see. Oh, oh, what, this, this is, oh, I know this person. I have rusty spots on the bottom tomato leaves and been picking them up. What is it? Thanks, and I love this resource. Thanks, Chris, thanks so much. Okay, those rusty colored leaves, they, they started as, um, as um, it's called early blight. And that's a fungal disease that splashes up from soil and gets in. And then the best thing is to spray with a fungicide and then pick those off because that'll keep it from splashing up the leaves going further. So, and, but, but we're seeing more of that. We're also, because it was so hot and so dry, um, a lot of the tomatoes really you know, lost their lower leaves just because it, it was just so hot and so dry. Okay, is the rat magic okay to use if you have a dog? It, it is, it really is. It'll keep the dogs away too. It won't hurt the dogs. And um, you know, it, it can irritate their nasal passages as well. Um, but they'll just avoid it. They'll just, but don't use it where they usually would use you know, dogs have their own spots where they use the restroom in their yards. So try not to apply it there because, you know, don't infringe on their areas, okay? And hopefully it's not right next to your vegetable garden. Okay, so now here are the, um, wait, I can't figure out which is which. The one, this is the question answer and this is the chat box. Okay, what height should I be mowing the lawn? Oh, that's great. Keep the lawn long. Keep it still at four inches. If you can keep it at four inches, that really helps it. The longer the blade, the deeper the root system is going to be. So, you know, try to keep it at four, three and a half, you know, you know, and, and, and then you don't have to do, worry about doing that low mowing until way, way, way until we get into the fall. That's the last mow of the year uh, where you cut it down to two to two and a half inches. But now you want to keep it at four inches. And usually that's the highest setting on the lawnmower. You know, and you know that, and and so it's easy. You set all the different adjustments on all four of the the wheels of the lawnmower. Set it all the way up to the top, and that that's the highest setting. Okay, good question. Good question. Okay, hi. When is the best time to treat uh, to transplant bee balm? Oh, that's a great that's a great question. Um, since it's a, a since it blooms, you know, all summer long, and bee balm that's Monarda. Monarda is pretty tough. You can really transplant it any time. I, I think because it's just gone into bloom. It went into bloom like the the middle of July, and it, and it so it's really in its prime right now. Um, I, I would wait. I, I would. That's one that I would advise doing. 
uh, early in the spring, you know, early in spring. So April, April, early May, you know, divide up, you know, bee balm, you know, that, that good question, good question. It can still look really good all through the fall. And I like to leave bee balm up. I like to leave the seed heads up for the goldfinches. And it doesn't seed, it doesn't seed out as much as things like black eyed Susans do. So Menarda, do that in, you know, the early spring, you know, the early spring. Great question. Okay, the herbaceous peony, uh, what has black marks on the stems. Would Immunox need to be sprayed now or in early spring? Or on new, oh, that's a different one. Then on new red bud leaves, it, it, it is, okay, in the middle, it has some yellow spots. Okay, okay, great, great questions. Okay, on, on the herbaceous peonies, okay, the black marks on the stem, that's rhizoctonia, and that's a soil-borne disease that gets in as the plants are emerging from the soil. Immunox is best sprayed on that in the early spring. What you wanna do is have your spray bottle of Immunox and, and be observant. Notice when the, the shoots that are just emerging from the ground and they're kind of pinkish red colored. And, and that's when you start spraying and you spray every two weeks as it's emerging out and that will prevent it from getting that rhizoctonia. Right now, just come in, prune those stems off and get rid of them, you know, just put them in the yard waste bag. Don't, don't compost them because, you know, that it's a disease that can get spread back out if you use the mulch. So, you know, you wanna do that. So the two things that we're always watching out for on, on, on peonies are the peonies measles, peony measles, that's the, the brown patches all over the leaves. And that's botrytis, that's botrytis. And a lot of times that gets in those leaves when the petals have dropped off and just sit on the leaves. And when they break apart, you know, it's a gray mold that breaks them apart, and then that can become a foliar leaf disease. So if you've sprayed with Immunox, it really protects them. They don't get it as much, you know, you know, as much. So I, I really, I really like using Immunox on the peonies. And best in the spring, um, you could do one more spray on all the foliage. I, I would hold off and do it uh, in September before I prune everything down. And because that's gonna that's gonna reduce a lot of the spore load that's out you know that's out there for next year, so just as a preventative. Okay, the next question was on new red bud leaves in the middle. Uh, they have this, some yellow spots. Those are, I'm, I'm assuming you're saying the little the, the, the leaves that are in the middle of the canopy of the tree. So you've got your outer canopy. Those leaves were formed early when our soil was really really wet. We had all that rain, and the, the the roots couldn't do their job. So it was incomplete pigmentation that formed, and so the leaves kind of turned yellow. They were either chlorotic or they just turned yellow right away. Or what the plant has realized in this heat and the drought is that you know the outer canopy is fine. I mean they didn't have enough water because we didn't get enough rain they're saying you know what we got to let you old guys that weren't formed properly so you're deficient we're going to make you jump overboard and we're going to pull any of the nitrogen out of you and and give it to the young guys because we've got to protect our future so we're, we're protecting the young shoots and the new buds and so they they rob peter to pay paul so we're seeing i've seen tons of that in in the plant formation center okay um so the main thing fertilize Give it some holly tone <coughs> and keep watering. Best thing you can do for red buds. Okay, now you trim new growth on hemlock and boxwood. Yes, and July, we usually say to do that at the end of July. You can get by doing it just a little bit more this week. Don't do it after the, the, the 15th of August because you'll trigger new growth and then that new growth is really susceptible to winter damage. We witnessed that after we had that real cold drop a year ago in February. And the plants that were that had the worst problems were boxwoods that were trimmed late in the season. And if you trim it in August, and that's usually what happens, the yard crews come in, they do that last shearing of all the boxwoods so they look nice and tight, little squares, and then new growth comes out, and that's what's really susceptible to cold damage and also sunburn, sunburn. So, so be cautious on doing too much pruning on any evergreens you know, after the 15th of this month. Good, good question. Okay, also, can you trim back a still be? You can, you can, you can trim back, you can trim a still be back. You know, the flower buds have, have, have dried, and you know if they don't look good you know because they got maybe too dry when they were first forming and then the foliage if it's browned out you can trim those back and it's not going to hurt them at all great great questions okay now okay um there's some more over here 
um, okay, herbaceous peonies with black marks on the stems when it need be sprayed now. Oh, we, that went in two places. Okay, what can you say, when you say not to put disease things in a compost, can you put them in the, yeah. Okay, the question is, you know, are you allowed to put disease things into the village yard waste bags? Well, I do, and you know, I guess theoretically, if that gets composted, and in, in the, the nice thing about um, the village yard waste bags is they go to more of a commercial composting area, and so the heat is much, much higher. So all the diseases and insects pretty much get burnt out in a, com in a commercial compost, where our home compost piles don't get as hot as they should. So we just say as a good rule of thumb, don't put diseased or insect um, cuttings and things in in your compost in your compost bin because unless you have a real active compost bin and you're tossing it all you know you're turning it all the time you know it's better just to be safe than sorry that was a great great question okay um, all right what time is it now ooh we're coming right in on the home stretch it's um, it's 151 and um, and I, I'm not seeing any new more any new questions. We had 25 people. Oh, here's another one. Very good tips, Usha. Thank you. It's always good to see your name. Uh, thanks a lot. Very nice. Very nice. I love seeing those. And um, and yeah, we we had we had 25 people that kind of stayed on board today. Thank you, everybody. And um, I, I love that. It, it seems like you're really enjoying um, the way we're we're doing this, where I come out with just you know. Everything I've been seeing, you know, for the last week in 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 the information center, and then and then you know and then what the recommendations are and what you should look at doing far going forward, you know, what's coming up, and then you, and I think you're getting comfortable with the fact that you can put your questions up here instead of sending them early. You can always send them early when you register, um, but I think everyone's getting really comfortable with just being able to put. A question up and knowing that I, I I'm learning I've learned pretty well haven't I I know how to do the questions and the answers and the chats and that you know that's how we have to do it isn't it so um, I, I love seeing I love seeing all your names on on here and I love to see the numbers and everyone's signing off so I'll get ready to sign off too and 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 you all know you all know that the garden coach is posted on the chalet. Um, YouTube page, so you can always go and 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 Carly is our person in our marketing department. She's been wonderful about getting them posted, usually the day after um, the the program, and then you can always catch up. Or if you miss it, you can always watch it. You can always watch it later. So so I think. I think we're doing pretty well. I'm feeling really good about hitting, you know, the you know the the ball out of the park with these. Oh, here's another one. A wonderful presentation, Marion. Thank you. Uh, I really like the, the 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 format you're using for your presentations. Thank you for the printouts. I really appreciate them and and have a great weekend. Thank you, you all. Now I'm not going to be um, in over the weekend because I have to have one of those medical procedures that we all have to have when we get to be older and you go in, you know, in and out of the hospital uh, for the day, for the morning. And, uh, and because of that, I have to get a COVID test tomorrow. And then I have to self isolate. Is that what they call it? Yeah. Self self isolate for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then my day, Monday off, what a day off I get to have that procedure. But um, so I won't be here, but leave your samples. And, and then we're setting up like the whole morning on Tuesday morning where I'm gonna go through all the samples and call everybody back. So, so if you miss me over the weekend, uh, know that I'm self-isolating and I will have a COVID test. So uh, I'll be able to tell you whether um, I've had it or not. And whether I have it, I, I, I'm pretty healthy. So, so uh, thank you all. Thank you, thank you for the good luck. Thank you so much, Usha. Thank you. And um, and let me see. It's six minutes till. I'll give you all one more time to put another late question, and then um, and then and, I, and we only have 17 people left. So people are signing off left and right. And uh, so I think I'll just say, uh, oh, Marion, thank you. Good luck. Thank you so much. Yeah. And um, and I'll just say thank you all, and um, I'll see you next week. All right, bye now. Okay, here it goes.
Bye-bye.